Hello and welcome to the 15th episode of the Mike McNair Revolutionary Strategy Series. Today is Wednesday the 26th of June 2019 and I'm your host Tom O'Brien. This week we continue our examination of Chapter 5, Communist Strategy and the Party Form. I have the new Patreon Cosmo to thank. You too can join the Patreon gang gang for only $5 a month which works out at $1 an episode. And you get to vote on the next reading group series, to listen to the episodes a few days early, and other cool stuff like access to the monthly only Patreon podcast. When we hit 100 patrons, the Patreon only podcast will become a fortnightly endeavour. If you'd like to become a Patreon and don't have the cash, I could always do with a little help with editing of the episodes. So if you fancy a bit of editing, drop me a line and let me know. If you'd like to comment on the show, please do so on the YouTube channel. Make sure to like, subscribe and share. You can also join me on Facebook or Twitter too. Okay, to the discussion. Hello and welcome to the 10th episode of the Mike McNair Revolutionary Strategy Series. We have Alexi Dog Robot. Alexi, say arf. Arf, arf. (laughs) What's that? Uh, we got Sophie from Trans Trans Revolution. Say Trans Trans Revolution. Trans Trans Revolution. Trans Trans go. Revolution. There we go. There we go. Now, here we are. We are halfway through Chapter 5, Communist Strategy and the Party Form. We can see it on the screen here, a party of a new type. So last week, McNair kind of got into talking about how the left, like the centre, should split from the right wing of the socialist movement and how we should keep ourselves independent of them, even if we're working in the same parties of them. So we should have, let's just read here what he says. We can and will take membership in parties and organisations they control and violate their constitutional rules and discipline in order to fight their politics, but we have to organise ourselves independently of them. That means we need our own press, finances, leadership committees, conferences, branches and other organisations. It does not matter whether these are formally within the parties which the right controls, formally outside them or part inside and part outside. This is tactics. The problem is to purify the movement, which is illusory, but to fight the politics of class collaborationism. That's where we left off last week. What do we think about that? Do we think that like he's trying to be very he's trying to finesse this by saying we needed to split from the right, but that's the only split we ever need to do, as opposed to what we find in in our actual weirdo left commie sex, where is we gotta keep splitting to get more and more pure until there's me, my cat, and uh, some <coughs> used dental floss in our organization. It's like this is also sort of the topic of the next chapter, like how to operate. Because he wants he wants this split this organizational split, but then you're allowed to kind of do joint actions and he lays out the conditions for that in the next chapter. I suppose it's not that kind of crazy. Like if you think like Marx and them split from the anarchists in what, 1870, what what year would they have, would they have split the first international? Oh, 71. Like yeah, I feel like it's they, 1871. So they split from the anarchists and now like we're saying the World War One split was the split from from the right, the social democrats, Mm -hmm. okay? And what he's making the case is that both of those splits are necessary. That we go from there. Like uh, later on, he's gonna side with Lenin in that we need to basically like try to attract anarchists and syndicalists on revolutionary grounds in in a bigger pact against these, you know, reformists, more or less these like a social chauvinist. I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that too. I think that's like, that, that's real. I think the context of the split in the first international was particularly against Bakunin. There was like some unsavory right. aspects of Bakunin in particular. You know, Marx and Engels didn't hide their difference of opinion from anarchism, but it seems like the, what they took issue with was Bakunin in particular, at least according to this book. I think I think McNair would agree that 1914 is 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 the real defining necessary split more so than what what was happening in i suppose 1871 or the the split around the first international if that's the wrong date 
OK, well, let, let's move on to hear now what basically the Bolsheviks set up the new organizational structure in the 1921 Third Congress thesis. This is how they kind of set up what they thought was the ideal party form. I have a few little things underlined here. He's going to go in. He says it's three critical elements. Let's give the first one a go. There are three critical elements in the new organizational concept. The first is that the party is to be a party of the vanguard, the advanced minority of the working class. It is not to lay claim to being directly the party of the mass of the working class, unlike, for example, the British Labour Party. The second related point is that it is to be an activist party, a party which organizes the political work of its members. OK, vanguard activists. And then the third one is that it is to be strictly centralized. So that's what we know today as the kind of Leninist party. That's what we're saying here. The party of the Bolshevik type. And also he has in here about like the ban on factions. This paragraph here. Do you want to have a go at this paragraph here, Lexi, and on, on about why these kind of particular party forms were Absolutely. Adopted? There is no doubt that these were intended to be strategic choices. They are grounded on the one hand by the positive balance sheet of the Russian Bolshevik party, which by 1920-21 was clearly winning the civil war. On the other hand, by the defeats suffered by the left in the German revolution of 1918 through 19 and Hungarian revolution of 1919, and by the Italian revolutionary movement of autumn 1920 in which the common turn leadership attributed to the lack of a party of a Bolshevik type. I just want to say here, so he's putting this into context of like what type of party you need essentially in a type, in a literally the time of actual revolution and war. You know, that's what he's kind of saying here, isn't it? Yeah, that, he goes on to explicitly state this in a little bit later on where he says like the reason for why the Bolsheviks thought all these things were necessary was because they thought the time for a civil war was now and Communist Party needs to be ready to engage in civil war essentially immediately. The Second International had built membership-based parties but had not theorized what they were. In this aspect, anti-Leninism is characterized by simple political unrealism and ends in practice either in total inability to organize or in reproduction of the worst aspects of so-called Leninism. What does he mean? Well, well, because there's a lot of mythology around the concept of a party of a new type. And what he's trying to say here is that, you know, there was a genuine advance being made in this discussion, but it's not what it's mythologized to be. So this whole concept of a new party, he says, is intensely contradictory. And what he means by that is that going beyond membership based parties and towards what he calls the party of, of activists was a good move. He thinks that's good. Why is he saying that's good? Well, I think why he's saying that's good is that there's a there's an overall shift in like what a party means. So the beginning of the paragraph, he's talking about how, like at the time of the Communist Manifesto, it says, uh, the new party concept is intensely contradictory. On the one hand, it is a genuine advance in the theorization of actual membership-based parties. Membership-based parties, as opposed to loose coalition political trends, which were... Uh, were an innovation of the of the later 19th century. And when Marx and Engels said that the communists do not separate party opposed to other parties of the working class and made similar statements about parties, it was the sort, this sort of broad, unorganized trend that they meant. So it was an innovation in that the party of a new type theorized this development in politics, right? Like the Second International built member-based parties, which hadn't existed before, but they didn't really theorize about them. And so what this party of a new type did was, was give an explicit theorization about this, about gen in general membership-based parties, but specifically what communists should do with these parties. Does that make sense? Yeah. So is he saying that the SPD, you know, before the war wasn't an activist party? No, I, he, what he's saying is that is that it was. Well, I don't know if it was an activist party, but it was a member based party. I, I guess so. So this is the split, basically. What this is what's being said is that that what Lenin and what this like Leninist like party innovation was doing was conceptualizing what like what something like the SPD was, which is a mass party, thinking that it's not going far enough to 
really grapple with the idea of a membership based party. If, if anyone had been in the DSA or has been in the DSA, like we're all familiar with the feeling of just, you know, basically paying a subscription fee and getting the newspaper and not really being a part of it, being a paper member or something like that. You know, Lenin was trying, Lenin and, you know, his co-thinkers, his, the Bolsheviks, other revolutionaries, they're trying to actually like theoretically suss out what it means to be a membership based party. So that like broader category of membership based party is broad enough to include the SP day, but also this supposed party of a new type. Part of the problem here is that there's a lot of mythology as to how new this is. This is where Lars Lee comes in. He, he has a really interesting book called Lenin Rediscovered, where he makes a, a, the case that this isn't all that different than the Kautskyan parties that came before, and that this was really a, like a type of Kautskyan party. He does a good job of resetting the narrative, but I, I think what McNair is doing here is sort of admitting that, yes, these are both membership-based parties, but Lenin is theorizing like a, a genuine advance in the party of activists, but also, as we'll go on to see, a kind of bastardization of what it would mean to be in a socialist party as well. Like, it's not all in advance. <laughs> okay, let's read this uh, paragraph here. On the other hand, it is also a theorization of what the Bolsheviks had done to their party in 1918 to 21, both in militarizing it and in setting it up as a minority dictatorship, a state authority against the working class. In this aspect, the new party concept, or as it came to be called after Lenin's death, Leninism, was a theory of the dictatorship of the bureaucracy and one which was to animate endless bureaucratic sects. Okay, so that's a kind of a, that's pretty harsh burn there. Burn is my favorite word in this book. Which part of these three was actually militarizing it? Well, I think all of it militarized it in different ways. Mm. But the idea of a vanguard party in Leninism is that there is like an elite cadre, right? Party of activists is, you know, you have kind of grunts that do the groundwork. And it, I think this will all be elaborated as we, as we go down. Okay, yeah, let's go. I, 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 th I think I think really to answer your question, Tom, is it's se the centralism because you could you can have a vanguard party of activists that isn't militarized in the same way. There is a sense in which parties are necessarily. I guess he says he says it right here. Let's just read it. That a party is only part of the society is logically necessary. That the organized membership of a political party, however large, is a minority, is a simple fact about political parties in capitalist society, even large ones like the Labour Party, etc. That in the case of a workers' party, this minority is in some sense the, quote, vanguard, is an idea which cannot be abandoned without abandoning the idea that the party should promote its distinct political program. If we are not, quote, more advanced in the sense of having a better understanding of the strategic line of march than non-members, then our organizing is a waste of time and money and is a fraud. And this is true of the Labour Party, as it is of left groups. If the job of the party is to represent the voiceless masses rather than to promote a distinct set of political ideas, it collapses into an organ of the state without political ideas. The character of the major capitalist parties in the two-party systems of much of the modern political world, the choice is that the unorganized masses are denied the genuine political choices which they could make when they vote, etc. The result is inherently anti-democratic. So before he goes into the obvious connotations of what a vanguard party actually brings to mind in the mind of any you know functioning human being that's dealt with the Marxist left, there is a sense in which we can't like abandon believing that we have something politically to offer. If we don't have something politically to offer, don't be in like outward facing like political like leadership group. That's what people who study these sorts of things should be able to practically offer. If if you just want to serve the people, you may end up being very much like a state, like like an arm of the state. And that, that it's sort of like the thing about sects that, in my opinion, leads towards, well, I guess it leads towards sectum is because it's around ideas. Without pluralism, this can obviously get hairy. Okay, yeah. let me take the next section then. There is a danger, however, that this vanguard party reasoning can be taken to rule out the possibility that the party is wrong and the non-party elements are right. 
in this case, the claim that the party is the advanced party becomes in principle untestable. Moreover, it logically follows that the leadership is the advanced part of the party and as such is in principle right against the backward elements of the ranks. Since the possibility that the backward elements are right is ruled out, the claim that the leaders are more advanced is untestable and is a matter of pure faith. Okay, yeah, so like these are just logical truisms, aren't they, really? It, it seems to be like that, you know, if you're in a case of war and you have to militarize a party, that seems like fair enough. But like the, this idea that all of these Leninist parties have taken this political form that was set up for a particular period in time and applied it to times where it doesn't apply just leads to exactly the kind of stuff we've just seen happening in the ISO where it fell apart. Let's have a look at these other set minutia that he, he has here from 10 years ago. The necessary consequence is that more advanced leading cadre are in effect justified by faith alone, as with the Calvinist elect. Like the dodgy end of the Calvinist elect, nothing is forbidden to them. Amongst the Trotsky organisations, the vanguard role has been used to justify violence in the workers' movement. A long list of dudes. <laughs> Cannon, the Lambert Lambertists, <laughs> the Heliites, the Laureates, the Social Worker Party. Taking money from questionable sources, the Lambertists, the Heliites, and sexual exploitation of female members, the Heliites, the Spartacus, and are we going to enjoy? Are we going to throw in the ISO in there now? Let's throw them in just for a laugh. They don't exist yeah. anymore. You can't. You can libel dead people, and they're dead. So let's do it. Okay. <laughs> These are merely pale shadows of the personal corruption and violence of the Stalinist bureaucracies. Yeah, I would just to briefly respond to something you said before, Tom. Even in times of war, you need to consider that maybe the boots on the ground have a clearer view of certain things than, you know, people sitting in the, in, I don't know, in the board of directors in the, the <laughs> ivory tower. Like, even if you are a militarized group, scientific socialism demands pluralism, damn it. <laughs> yeah. Like, I was yeah. going to say something similar. Like what, when you, when you, the issue is that, that their way, they were in a civil war, they did this and then they never stopped. Right. And so, like, you might have to change up your structure and strategy, you know, I mean, you should change up your stru structure and strategy if you're in an active war situation, but you shouldn't try to simply redo this. And I think that's where a lot of the Soviet defenses kind of go awry, is that they don't see, they see flaws, but they don't, if that makes any sense. I think they're underestimating, like, how much this becomes entrenched once you go down this road. I, this also kind of seems like a, it seems like he's articulating the way centralism kind of like the, the Leninist version of centralism kind of fucks up all these other components, which might have like been good and and, and if they were done in a different way. I guess you could have like a pluralist vanguard party of like of intellectuals of different competing stripes that all have contempt for the workers. And that would still I don't know that that might just be a problem within the concept of being a vanguard party. And this could be open to the, to like Luxembourg's critique of the concept of the way vanguard works for Leninism. Well, I think like a pure Leninist vanguardism isn't what we should try to do, which I think is more or less what McNair is saying here. And I think that kind of the, uh, you know, intellectual party elite versus the grunts gets addressed more explicitly in the section on the party of activists. Um, so okay. I think you need to take all these critiques together to kind of solve the problems of the other part, if that makes any sense. Yeah, maybe I'm trying to, like, uh, follow his typology too much. <laughs> Don't force it, Lexi. Don't force it. Well, oh, they all work okay. together. So. It's almost uh, there. No, no, no. I'm in charge here. Screw you. Screw you, lot. <laughs> You're the grunts. And the All vanguard. Right. What, what okay, are you, Brian? I want to hear yeah. you following party <laughs> line here, bitches. <laughs> okay, okay, Chief O'Brien. Uh, that's it. I like it. That's the we, way it's got to be. We've we've, we've got a <laughs> got a whole lot of DS nine ahead for you. <laughs> party of activists. Okay. The idea of the party of activists is in itself no more than a recognition that political activity is work and that like other forms of work, it benefits from commitment and organized division of labor. It also has a civic Republican aspect to it. 
That is, it is counterposed to the liberal and market political science view of, of parties, which sees party leaderships as firms offering political brands to the atomized voter consumer or member consumer. In contrast, in the party of activists, the party member is to be an active citizen of his or her party through active involvement in a branch, faction or other party body, which does its own collective work as part of the body and a passive consumer member is not to have a vote. So okay. is he saying here, like, that you have to be active to get a vote in the party? He this, kind of is, doesn't he? From what I understand, this is the substance of the bolshevik menshevik split. A question about what it means to be a party member of a social democratic party. And it seems like McNair really sides with the Bolsheviks on this. That the problem of, you know, paper membership and this idea of the passive member consumer, the voter consumer, this problem is, is such a big deal that we need to eliminate like a lot of small levels of involvement in the party as members. You know, they could they could help out, I guess, but they're not really members, are they? Like, I think, yeah, McNair's going going along with that. But but how do you grow? Like, how do you grow a party to get like to be 50, 60 percent if you're only getting the ones who will run around like blue arse flies at the time of elections and stuff? I really don't know how this part works with the electoral focus i'm not sure there's something that doesn't add up about that as does his continental asterisks on electoral politics there's something that doesn't add up to me about it it seems like maybe the easiest way to address this is that like a minimum level of involvement like if you're going to your branch meetings like you're involved enough to have a say and if your branches are reporting to like the central body or central committee or whatever, then they're active enough to have a say, maybe, perhaps. And then if you, you know, just kind of disappear for a while, like you're not a member anymore. I've been in orgs that kind of function on, on similar grounds. Like even if you're not like, quote unquote, like doing shit in your community or, you know, trying to like get a candidate in or something like that. If you're at least attending me meetings, you're active enough to have a say. But I don't know if that's what McNair had in mind, but. It seems reasonable to me to, you know, if you're not showing up to shit for a long time, then you're not really a member, are you? I can't help but think about the American political context. And, you know, I'm sure it's not, I'm sure it's not completely different in other places. I'm sure it could be different. There's like political hobbyists that have a lot of time on their hands and there's working people who don't. And the sort of natural way that that filters out a lot of working people. I don't know. There, there were, you know, serious worker members of the Communist Party back in the day, but there was also stronger unions and just a whole scene that came out of workers having a say in their lives. There's something well, about this whole thing that okay. puzzled me. I think the answer to that, or one, one way to like address that too, is that like to have regular online communications, and that's where technology really com becomes useful. Is that like. You know, in Renegar Vault, if somebody wasn't like, coming to meetings, but they're at least checking in on their online communication saying like, hey, I'm really busy. I'm going through a lot of shit at work or my kids are, you know, going to soccer games or whatever. You know, we're not going to kick them out. Right. So you like, should. okay, um, <laughs> oh my God. go, go fix some replicators of mine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would love to. Um. You know, I think we should use smoke signals. Smoke signals have gone out of fashion. I think they're 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 the future. I'm, I'm trying, Tom. I'm trying. I'm trying to generate enough smoke signals for everybody. Good. <laughs> okay, let, let's just read. I think this this paragraph is going to say what he's kind of getting at. I forgot it. Is though the common term text address address directly only the shortcomings of the social democracy. In this aspect, they have grasped the fundamental feature of the capitalist political order in parliamentary regimes i.e. that what is given with one hand through universal suffrage is taken away with the other through the constitution of the party system. I think he's getting here to like this idea that if it's just this passive suffrage that people just like, get de-radicalized. I think that's is that's his general point. This is part of his interesting like comments on the changing character of democracy with universal suffrage or you know something that he's not even that psyched to, to call democracy because what is taken away via the constitution of the party system, you know, et cetera, that it, it's sort of, it's sort of in step with his general ad advocacy of the democratic Republic, but unlike Marx and uh, the latter angles and unlike the Mensheviks, he doesn't see like the form of the democratic Republic as we know it 
in its bourgeois form to act to be like a fitting form of proletarian state. But he does want some kind of democratic republic as that form, as all these people did. Yeah, so let's move on. The other negative side of the party of activists idea is given by its combination with the quote, actuality of the revolution. The idea that the trouble with the Second International was its passive propagandism, and that the tasks of the workers' movement have gone beyond propaganda to agitation intended to lead to the immediate struggle for power. Taken together with the idea of a developed division of labor, this idea leads all too easily to the creation of a division of labor between the grunts at the base who are to run around like blue arse flies from one agitational initiative to the next, and the thinkers in the leadership. Self-education of the militants at the base and long-term propaganda work for ideas that are not currently agitational is damned as propagandism. Yeah. Does not seem to describe like every Leninist sect. And that's a Doesn't shame it? because he, even um, when Lenin was arguing in left-wing communism for you know why you participate in elections in bourgeois society, a big part of it was propaganda. What a what a shame to like dismantle like kind of the main thing that that's good for. Yeah, absolutely. This is like 1921 or you know 18 to 21, like the 21 principles. So the Lenin of left-wing communism, if I'm correct is much earlier before they take power and so no 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 uh it's in, it's very interesting actually the lenin of left con of left-wing communism that's 1920 and so oh, yeah oh, he's like I, corrected. I think at that point he is no longer defending the idea of the council government and he's sort of moved on to the he's like going towards you know high leninism and like the kind of thing that Lenin would actually be known for, but his thought is still a little more subtle, but it's, yeah, it's the Lenin of left-wing communism might be like one of the last, like, like mixed bag text before he hardens into what Leninism sort of becomes. I just wanted to say before we go on, that I, I, I often use blue arse flies as a, <laughs> you know, what, run around like a blue arse fly. So it's an expression straight from my heart. That's lovely. It's a very colorful expression. Like, just the idea of division of labor. And it should be obvious to communists that creating, like, a hardened division of labor, like, and just leaning right the hell into it and having, like, a bunch of people on a leash that you, you just run around and, you know, holding all the cards is, like, a terrible recreation of, of like, the earliest forms of class society. <laughs> <laughs> or like the most basic so form, I should say. Logically, it's like division of labor is it's the beginning, you know? Like I don't think division of labor is what McNair is taking an issue with. And I'm not saying I don't no, 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 no. see. But you're playing with fire. It's, no, I don't I don't think he's saying that you don't do division of labor. Division of labor is necessary, and he says like it, it helps, but like the the idea of the party of activists has within it the idea necessity of division of labor. And the division of labor together with this idea of the actuality of the revolution. Centralism. Well, th this Isn't is more, it? well, this is more of the, the belief in, you know, the, the coming kind of, oh, it's, you know, this is all around the corner. I guess this could be tied into centralism in a way, like I'm still getting hung up on the typology. These are all really aspects of the same thing. L let's read what th this little bit here. The paradoxical effect is to reinstate the liberal market bourgeois party form. The members, though active, are active doing what the leaders tell them and cease to be really active citizens of their party. The leaders become a firm selling a brand, the Socialist Workers' Party, the Workers' Power, Alliance for Workers' Liberty. Dissent, especially dissent about fundamentals, becomes enemy of activism, and the activisms themselves resent the dissenters who are stop stopping them getting on with the job. In this framework, a serious serious disagreement inevitably leads to a split. So I think this articulates really how you can do a party's activists better in that, like, it's not, you should have leadership, but it's not so much that you need a hard division of labor. Party members with quote unquote grunts or whatever should be able to dissent and should be able to disagree and should be able to like taught and be educated and to think critically about these matters. Sometimes leaders should get off their ass and do something. Is that if that makes sense? Like soften these divisions of labor, help build up each other in several different skills. 
there's no easy question to like uh, how to like break down division of labor, but uh, excuse me, there's no easy answers to develop to how to break down division of labor, like or how to like subvert it or something like. But it's it's pretty much absolutely necessary to like try it within your organization to like rotate or something, or to try to get people to be well rounded, or at least like try to leave them with skills that can serve them in the outside world instead of just like using them and frankly sort of hyping them up with the actuality of the revolution and then taking their free work. Cause that's kind of, ex- again, not only do we have division of labor as an element of class, then we're talking about free work and taking people's work and selling them on, on, on an ideology to, to suck out their surplus labor. You know, like we're just, <laughs> just recapitulates everything. <laughs> Okay, let's move on to the the daddy centralism. Daddy centralism. Okay. Yeah, daddy. Yeah, daddy. Okay. Uh, uh, Sophie, do you want to take this little paragraph here? Sure. Centralism has two sentences. The first, the absence of legal constitutional rights of the states or organizations, components, cantons, providences, branches, etc., to sovereignty in their patch. I stress legal constitution rights, first because in their absence, the center may still not practically be able to enforce its will in the localities. See, for example, the SWP's difficulty in turning its its local branches around respect. Uh, Second, because in the absence of legal constitutional rights of the components, we do not have federalism. England, before the rise of mass suffrage, was deeply politically committed to the autonomy of local governments but that did not make this country federal. Having federalism thus implies having a constitutional court to decide whether the censure has invaded the component's rights. Federalism is, in other words, a form of dictatorship of the lawyers. That is why the U.S. capitalist class at the time of the creation of the U.S. Constitution preferred federalism to democratic republicanism. In this sense, the common term centralism was right. Federalism, even in the sense of dictatorship of the lawyers, may, of course, be a step forward in relation to what actually exists. Thus, for example, Marx and Engels argued that a federation of the British Isles would be preferable to the existing UK unionism. There's, there, there is a way that like, we need to... There is a kind of federalism that's bourgeois and probably isn't going to work like for this. However, like the kind of centralism that this was used to justify is terrifying and some, something that's potentially even worse. It seems, uh, he doesn't come out and explicitly say this, but it seems like he prefers the kind of centralism of like a democratic republic. But what Lenin did was a, he calls it Bonapartism, which he gets into in this paragraph. Take it away. The second sense of centralism is the sense Engels points to in his critique of the Erfurt program. He denounces the French form of the state as the empire established in 1799 without the emperor. The existence of a centralized, hierarchical, bureaucratic apparatus in which local officials are appointed from and responsible to the center rather than a locally elected. It was this Bonapartist sort of centralism which the Bolsheviks created in their party in 1918 to 21 and exported in the 1921 theses. So he's going to get into this idea of at every level, the people who are getting nominated to different roles is coming from the top. That was the Bolshevik model. And I think he's kind of going to go against this idea. He goes on here to talk about when uh, Trotsky wrote about the Bolshevik part. Let, let's read this paragraph here as well. Let me have a go at this one. <laughs> I know we're going to read this whole second chapter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've underlined the whole chapter, but it's interesting. You know, This part uh, is pretty dense. So the Bolsheviks in 1921 represented this centralism as the historic character of their faction party since 1903. This representation was codified in Zinoviev's 1924 history of the Bolshevik party, but it was an unambiguous falsification of their history. Trotsky wrote in 1931 that whoever is acquainted with the history of the Bolshevik party knows what a broad autonomy the local organizations always enjoyed. To their own papers in which in which they openly and sharply, whenever they found it necessary, criticized the actions of the Central Committee. Had the Central Committee, in the case of principal differences, attempted to disperse the local organizations before the party had an opportunity to express itself, such a Central Committee would have made itself impossible. This view has been confirmed by detailed modern historical research 
into Bolshevik practice down to 1918. So he's saying like this idea of the top down approach with no autonomy at the base is antithetical to how the Bolsheviks themselves organized prior to 1918. And it's like it's got codified in these 1921 things and everybody just assumes that's what was done. But that's not why it was done. He's got, Let's just read this paragraph here and he'll talk about why it was done. It's reasonably clear why the Bolsheviks did it. They thought it was a necessity of civil war. That was also why they exported it. The parties of the common turn needed to be parties fit for civil war. In fact, the idea that civil war implies Bonapartism centralism can readily be falsified by the experiences of the English Civil War, the French Revolutionary War before 1799, and the American Revolution and Civil War. So, like, this is weird. Like, what is it about, like, say, dudes like Zinoviev when they're writing the party history? Why do they just lie about why they do these things? What is that about? I mean, I can only guess because I haven't read it, but I would imagine that, I don't know, it doesn't even make the Bolsheviks look better. It, it, it could justify why, why the Bolsheviks did what they did because they could just say, oh, well, it's always been like that. Is it justifying but, why they're not putting it back? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, uh, totally. What? Like, oh no, the party's always been like this. What are you talking about? This is what the Bolshevik Menshevik split was about. Is exactly this, this thing that we're doing right now. Oh yeah, this oh yeah, yeah, this is this is totally what we wanted. Was Lenin alive in 1924? I, I believe he died in 24. Was Stalin in power yet? This is the Troika period, if I'm not mistaken, where there's it's like split. And and you know, Zinoviev was a was a big player because especially because of his role in the Communist International. And he had been, you know, he'd been one of the top Bolsheviks. He wrote uh Socialism and War with Lenin in 1915. What was that? That was a train. I live near trains. <laughs> trains, trains, uh, revolution. Goddamn trains. Trains, trains, revolution, yeah. Well, trains, trains, locomotion. That's what it should be called. <laughs> um, <laughs> fuck this oh, socialism, communist, communism stuff. We should just get into train spotting. I had That's a. Right. I, I was in board school with a guy who was a train spotter and a hardcore train spotter. And he had tapes for his like walkman i said what do you listen to there he says oh i'm listening to like the the dublin to wexford express <laughs> and he had like he had like sound of the train tracks going just like an wow. hour of it and he had different like different <laughs> trains <laughs> wow oh my god that's I, really remarkable i met him and I, and i asked him about it like and he denied it but it it was true it's just so disingenuous how these guys act that in 24 they just rewrite the thing and try and say it's always been like that. Yeah, I was just trying to give him kind like of a sickening, isn't it? I was trying to give him like a decent read or something, but yeah, Zinoviev does not come off smelling like flowers. Zinoviev, like, I think in like the ISO and like Tony Cliff's style of Marxism, they basically just pin all the problems of Leninism on Zinoviev and they call it Zinovievism as an attempt to save Leninism. But like, you can't. Zinoviev was like a very important Bolshevik. And like, like I, how he, could he does represent like a lot of the party. If Zinoviev yeah. was an outlier, he wouldn't have been as, as prominent as he was. Exactly. So he's saying here that they didn't need to, to, to do it in a civil war, that other places didn't do it in civil wars. In reality, it was required in Russia by the combination of the failure of the German workers movement to come to the aid of the Russian Revolution and the Bolshevik adoption of the Neuronics Distributive Land Program. This left the Bolsheviks effectively isolated in a peasant-dominated country. The only way to resist the whites was to base themselves on the peasants, which they duly did. Representing the peasants forced them to create the sort of state that peasant revolutionary movements normally tend to create which is an absolutist one. The recreation of new Chinese dynastics after peasant revolts, the peasant support for late feudal absolutism, 17th century Sweden, France, etc., and French Bonapartism itself are all examples. The Bolsheviks built up a Bonapartist state around the party, and to do so, they changed the party into the empire without the emperor. So 
you know, we were talking earlier about how they thought they had to do this because of the Civil War. Really, it's all a bunch of bullshit. And I don't even know if they necessarily realize it's a bunch of bullshit. They, it seems like they really believe that this kind of stuff was necessary to win a Civil War. And they had the track record to prove it. But realistically, it seems like there is, this came about by situations out of their control. So he's making the case then that because they had to like form a massive coalition with the sickle, the hammer and the sickle, the workers mm -hmm. and the peasants, that they ended up kind of having a lot of the political motives that McNair is just kind of, I would like to see the, the statistical evidence for this and not just cherry picking, to be honest, that peasants are only able to, you know, or have a tendency towards absolutism. And he's basically then saying Zinoviev and Stalin, these guys, they just represented the sickle. That was the reason for where, why it went up that way. It seems a little programmatic to me. It is, but this is a longstanding like Marxist theory and like idea that like a dictatorship of the peasantry is going to come out very differently and that there's something very different between the kind of uprisings and dictatorships that you had in feudal Europe versus the kind that you would have in bourgeois Europe. This, there is something Marxian that like, this is, this is like a Marxian thesis. I think this does come out of Marx's and Marx and Engels body of work. So is it like maybe a questionable premise that we should try to substantiate more? Yes. But I think it's, it's perceptive to not, um, but wait a second now, wait a second. Like, yeah. Where is a counterexample? We've got no revolution that hasn't led to an absolutist one that was socialist. So why are we saying socialist revolutions are somehow not absolutist as well? They've all well, tended that way. That's the critique given here is that both in the USSR and China, these were essentially, these they formed dictatorships of peasants instead of dictatorships of the proletariat because they're peasant majority countries, which I think right. is kind of the, the point that he, McNair is making here is that it wasn't a civil war that necessitated this kind of party, but rather the peasantry. Well, you know, yeah, fair enough. But like, why are we saying that the proletariat won't end up with an absolutist one? No, I mean, no, this is a very good question because if you think about the debate within the Bolshevik party, there was a strand that was associated with more of the left that was like, look, we're a, we're a proletarian party. Okay, peasants, fine. But we have to stay true to our vanguard principles and be, you know, proletarian communist party. Whereas there was what was thought of as the right. And, you know, people like people like Stalin ended up taking points of view like this that, well, listen, in order to be democratic, we have to represent the peasantry. Ultimately, that's the that's what they went with. And there's a whole very like hard hearted anti democratic, but oh, we have to be more proletarian quote unquote, like streak in the, in the party. And that, that streak may have ended up with, you know, a similar policy towards the peasantry because Stalin is famously identified in, in like that third international, you know, left, right center. He's thought of as the center in a way, because he would zigzag between the left and the right. Sure. He buddied up with the, the peasants in like an earlier period and was closer to the right. He was closer to the right than the left. And then when it came time to do forced collectivization, in, instead of having a broader NEP, right? He ends up going with this strategy that's closer to what Trotsky was putting out there. Now, it's, it's a real question that whether a real proletarian party that was really representing proletarian interests would have ever done anything like forced collectivization. But it brings up two things. One, that even if you're not attempting to represent peasant interests, you might end up doing horrible centralism. And, you know, the other thing being that none of these communist revolutions happened in, without peasants, <laughs> like more or less. And um, really, if you, if you think about it, that these revolutions are of a kind with the bourgeois revolutions. And that, that's something that wasn't lost on a lot of the people performing them. But they were hoping to go further. And sadly, that wasn't in the cards. You know, that was my Karl Popper turn. But it's wait, good. what if <laughs> all the commies are just going to turn to Stalin turn? But it is a question to oh, ask. Really? You know, it's a reasonable question yeah. to ask. Um, Something in the, the YouTube chat, apparently Bookchin 
Federici tracked like decentralized decentralized peasant revolts, which I think I, as, as now I'm thinking about it, anarchists tend to talk about the, these kinds of uh, peasant revolts more than commies do. Yeah, uh, yeah, peasants were uh, a classical sort of like response to the proletariat. No, look, like the peasants can be revolutionary, but a lot of that was thought of outside of Marxian strategy. And it's you know, funny how history works. Okay, so he's going to go on here and talk about how all these detours that have gone this way, all these communist parties that went ML after 1921, how they led to a bloody they roll back to capitalism by a long and bloody detour. Russia itself, Yugoslavia, China, Albania, Vietnam. In fully yeah, that, capitalist- that's, if, that's if they take power. That's the best case scenario, right? Yeah, if they take power. In fully capitalist countries, they can have one of three fates. Firstly, they can evolve back into Kautskian parties. The clearest cases are the French and Italian communist parties. Such parties officially prohibit factions, but have them de facto and are officially Bonapartist centralist, but in practice allow a lot of leeway to branches and factions. I would say that I would say that McNair really admires this period of the Communist Party, and not because they actually pursue a centrist strategy that allows for factions. Like he's, you know, like he's he's mentioning, yeah, of course they formally didn't allow factions. And elsewhere he says, yeah, they were trying to pursue a right-wing strategy. But uh, after after the 50s, communist parties were persona non grata. And so they ended up being these like centri- centrist, like unwilling centrist, uh, unwilling pluralist communist parties. I think he has a soft spot for the communist parties of the Khrushchev period. So when you mean unwilling pluralist, unwilling centralist, what are you, what are you saying exactly? Oh, well, like unwilling centrist, not centralist. So, Sorry. Like, uh, yeah, like they wanted to be like b- proper bourgeois coalitionists. But the after the secret speech and uh, sending in the tanks, uh, the bourgeoisie didn't, you know, they weren't going to break bread with the fucking communist party anymore. Like that, those popular, that popular front shit was way over. So they were kind of because they're not left-wing communists, right? They're not like uh, abstentionists. They were forced into a centrist strategy without really wanting to. And then just what he's saying here, I don't know if it's truly the case that they in practice allowed a lot of leeway to branches and fractions, but it reminds me of something that like, of, of all people, Amadeo Bordiga, the, he, was a, he was an old communist party uh, leader you know, back in the day. And he became one of these weird, like left Leninists. But um, his point was that, listen, it doesn't matter if it does, you know, who cares if you have multiple parties, all that matters is that you're able to have like debate within the party. Next one. They can turn into small bureaucratic centralist sects. Most of the Trotsky's and Maoist groups and some official communist ones, or this is my favorite. They can collapse altogether. Okay, adopting and exporting Bonapartist centralism was just plain wrong. When it was completed by the 1921 ban on factions, it left no legal means by which the working class could get its party back. As became apparent in the fate of the opposition of the 1920s, it tended to emphasize the negative rather than the positive sides of the vanguard party and the party of of, of activists. So it's primarily centralism he's coming down on. Oh, yeah. No, he's, he's pretty hard on centralism. Yeah, he likes these Kautskian parties. That's why he wrote so much about them. He thinks they're like under theorized and under understood. Okay, so now he's going to do a, a wee bit on the what sort of party. We've got like one page here, and I, again, I've underlined every goddamn line, so let's just give it a go. At present, the mass workers' parties, wherever they exist, are so dominated by the class collaborationist, coalitionist right as to be little more than left capitalist parties. Burn. The larger, the larger small parties of the left, the surviving official communist parties, the Rifondazione Communista and Die Linke, are also dominated by the coalitionist policy. To their left is a wilderness of bureaucratic centralist sects. <sighs> Ain't too much change, McNair. Rip. Rip. The working class urgently needs new political parties and a new international, which stands for the working class pursuing its independent interests. What sort of party? In italics. 
it is impossible to get out of where we are now without being willing to read the texts and lessons of the early common turn, but to do so critically, italics. To accept the common turn texts at face value produces bureaucratic centralism and splitism. To take them at face value and reject them out of hand produces either complete inability to act, the anarchists, movementists, left and council communists, etc., or collapse back into the policy of union with the right on the right's terms, the labour left, etc. The party of a new type was both a real advance in the party theory of the Second International and simultaneously the process of bureaucratization of the Russian Communist Party, and hence of the parties of the common turn. It is necessary to disentangle these elements and fight for a democratic centralism, which is not a synonym for bureaucratic centralism. So he's coming yeah. back to centralism now. What is he meaning by democratic centralism as opposed to what these Leninist parties do now? Because they call democratic centralists, right? don't they? He, he's trying to appeal to some kind of Republican centralism that is basically a far superior form of centralism than what is called in real life democratic centralism. Because when you hear democratic centralism, you should be reaching for your Kalashnikov. Like that's that's when you're, you're starting to get into some weird commie buzzwords for authoritarian power dynamics. I, I, I think the most interesting thing that's being said here is that is that he has a threefold critique of basically every existing left strategy here. He criticizes the Leninists, he criticizes the anarchists and the left communists, and then he criticizes the reformist social democrats, all on the basis of a wholesale acceptance or rejection of the text of the common turn, the early common turn. That's a pretty sophisticated critique. He's trying to carve out a space that isn't just autonomist or Leninist or reformist. He's going for it. But it, I don't know how well he succeeds all the time, but the fact that he's like really going for this and has like a systematic critique of all of this, I'm never sorry for reading it, even if sometimes I'm like dumbfounded. Well, look, it's kind of ironic that he spent the whole chapter here burning on the Leninist, you know, the ML sect kind of form, not just, but all the Communist Party forms post 21. The activists, the democratic centralism and the what's the other one? Uh, what's the other one? The vanguard, right? But in the, the end, he says the vanguard is all right. <laughs> the activist is good, and the democratic centralism is grand. <laughs> At the end of his critique, <laughs> that's what he does. He does because he wants like a different kind of. I mean, you know, when, the more I look at this, I suppose he wants a, a better Leninism. You know, like, like if you look at that, it sounds like kind of crazy, but in a way, like, I think McNair is easier. McNair likes the Khrushchev communist parties. It seems like better than he likes the CPs, you know, at the time of the formation of the common turn. <laughs> like, I don't know. This is confusing to me. This is something that I would love clarified by McNair. You know, like when he says critically read the text of the, and the lessons of the early common turn. To what extent is it necessary to identify as or or to think of, you know, Leninism? You know, like what what it, what good is that if we're not doing a wholesale acceptance of the common turn? What what are what are we trying to do or say by having a political culture that sees itself as continuous with that? I would imagine his response would be something to the effect that Leninism is a confused term and we shouldn't get too caught up on it, which might seem like a dodge, but like he kind of has a point. Like, what the fuck does Leninism even mean? You know what I mean? And it seems like he's super critical of not just like, you know, common turn Marxist Leninist parties, but also Trotskyists and a lot of, you know, what we might think of as like the better Leninists. But as critical as he is of all forms of Leninism, it seems like there's something really important to take from it, which I think, you know, he's got a point. Like, I don't know. It's important to really to grapple with what Lenin attempted to do and what Lenin actually did. To me, like what he doesn't address it in this chapter, but like what he has to really do is to 
parse out this sentence here. You know, it is necessary to disentangle these elements and fight for a democratic centralism that is not, which is not a synonym for bureaucratic centralism. Like he has to parse this out. I know. I think we get into in chapter nine, but like, you know, that's the irony of his like sick burns the whole way through, and he ends up coming back fully on target with all of their uh, three innovations. Anyway, let's let's have a list. Let's have a read of this sentence here. The split in the Second International was not a sectarian error on the part of the communists. It was required by the unwillingness of the coalitionist right to act democratically. Marxists have to organize in a way which is not dependent on unity with the right. We have to accept that the split in the Second International will not be reversed unless Marxists together abandon our politics and accept the corrupt world of Blairism, etc., Look, I don't know what he means about Tony Blair's corrupt. I don't see what's wrong with going off and making <laughs> millions of pounds working for right-wing dictators all over the globe. Like, what the fuck is McNair's problem? Yeah. Leave that man alone. Yeah. Hero, hero of socialist work. labor. The world, he's doing God's work. Yeah, God's work. Yeah. I tell you. Now. Good Christian, he did nothing wrong. Absolutely. Now, we've got our last two paragraphs. Who wants to give these a go? Let's do it. But splitting does not purge the movement of opportunism. It is a defensive necessity, not a means of offense. The way to fight opportunism is not to seek purity by separation or fear contamination with the touch of pitch. That road leads only to organizational sectarianism coupled with political collapse into opportunism. Rather, we also have to fight for terms of partial unity with the right as to both achieve the maximum class unity round particular goals that can be achieved and to bring our politics into confrontation with the right's politics. That was for the common turn and remains today the task of the policy of the United Class Front. United Front, bitches. That's what he's saying. Yeah, so in my conversations with Derek about the book, when Derek gets really salty, he's like, damn it, like, we know a bunch of people that read this book and became fucking Leninists, like at like ass out Leninists, like defending all kinds of crazy shit anyway. And that every kind of Leninism presents itself as the critical kind of Leninism. You know, he's going to get into the problem with talking about the idea of the United front and how the Trotskyist version of the United front is the enemy of the United front. <laughs> like, He's, you know, there seems to be like some kind of dialectic internal to Leninism that generates this kind of critical replication of errors, you know, with all of your critical criticism intact. And then you, you know, you still shit the bed. There's, there's something about that that's unaccounted for me that maybe I'm just asking for him to be more consistent, to not be a Leninist or something, you know, and that like, I don't know. I do think that there is some content to Leninism. I'm I'm a little I'm a little less uh, charitable about this because this is you know this is a chapter where he's interrogating but ultimately defending most of the core concepts of Leninism, but but not 1921 idea of the party of a party of civil war. He's not defending that. Well, but a lot of you know there there are Lenin other Leninists that, that before, don't do that. But before that, like Lenin wasn't advocating those strategies in like 1903, was he? No, but I feel like there's something about the structure of even people, I don't know, there's something there's something about the structure of thought that even people that don't advocate the 1921 stuff. I'll give you an example, which people that are sometimes called bordigists that are that take after the kind of left leninist like objection, but that di they didn't they weren't like autonomous. They were they were a little like more anti-democracy even. But like they conceived of themselves as creating a Leninism that wasn't warped by Bolshevization in 1921. And that Bolshevization was this bullshit mythology and that they had the true Leninism. And you can kind of see where that, you know, that doesn't get out of the dialectic. That doesn't get out of this problem. Maybe to call it dialectic is charitable. It's a, it's, it's some kind of stasis. There's some kind of problem that, I don't but feel like it's, it's grappled with here. Even if I, I don't know, it's like I agree on paper, you know, this is fine. But, like, but that could be like, it could be that, you know, the strategy is sound, but that society is not ready for it. You know what I mean? Oh, like oh that. but what, what does that mean? 
You know what I no, mean? I, like, I, no, but I mean literally like that right now, the people that are attracted to this strategy are people who are in the radical left and, you know, those Leninist sex and most of them are, you, you just need more and different types of people than those people on some level. You know what I mean? <sighs> right. But when I say a structural like, problem, I, I mean something that won't be solved by having different people in it. You know what I'm saying? Like, but like the structure could be, it could be a societal, like is in like, you know, if the left is radical, the community left is so weak that you're not going to have a large influx of people who can do stuff and can take a forward a strategy that you end up with these small individual groups that try and put it into, but obviously it won't work and they end up going down and just flailing around and falling apart. I just think an awful lot of the people that are attracted to Leninist parties right mm -hmm. now are people who I don't know what I'm well, they're, they're they're they're, they're kind of authoritarian. Everybody who listens to my show, they're authoritarian, authoritarian poli political street. hobbyists. They're political hobbyists, yeah. and and they have like a stick up their ass, just like someone who's like a Star Wars fan that want, you know, like <laughs> like, <laughs> like that hates the Last Jedi or something. Yeah, yeah, you know? like definitely not everybody, but uh, maybe not even the majority, but enough to ruin the organizations. Well, yeah, some Star Wars fans are great, you know. <laughs> I don't know if this is 100% related, but like it, it brings to mind like a debate I got into regarding something looking like this last paragraph, you know, fight for partial forms of unity with the right so as both to achieve the maximum class unity around particular goals. So assuming that, you know, whether this is accurate or not, let's just assume for the sake of argument that the right in, in this sense uh, of this debate is Stalinism, right? So... I, I knew somebody who was arguing that it's okay to organize with Stalinists to form unity around particular goals and even allow them into your party as long as there's programmatic agreement. And my experience with dealing with Stalinists is that they will wreck orgs because they think they have all the answers and it needs to be a, a proper Marxist-Leninist party or organization. My, my question is, does that fit in the framework of McNair? You see what I'm saying? Like, is, is organizing with, with Stalinists and even allowing them into your party in line with McNair? It seems like that there could be some kind of, like, early common turn and Khrushchev period defense of Leninism that could, in theory, try to set itself so far apart from Stalinism that it, you know, I don't know. Like, I don't even, I don't know if it's compatible I don't know if it's compatible. I think I have a hard time answering this question, but what I can say for sure is that this could be reconstructed in such a way that excludes Stalinists. Because in my, in my opinion, using McNair's own words, we're talking about dweebs who want to split to pr have some kind of pure split or purge in order to have some right. kind of pure revolutionary cadre, which is something that something like that has happened to an org I used to be involved with, right? I see people who want to just keep doing this, even though they're critical, incre sometimes incredibly critical of Stalinism. Right. They think it's going to be different this time. Like these people are going to like somehow not do what they're going to do, what they've always done. And it's going to be fine. And I'm not even saying that we shouldn't, you know, if you're at like an action, let's say, or whatever, like you shouldn't block with Stalinists, like, they're on your side of the barricade, they're on your side of the barricade in that particular circumstance. But to allow them into your party and to just trust that they're not going to split as soon as they get the chance or try to purge you is incredibly naive. And there's something about Leninism, I think that's kind of what we're what you're getting at, Lexi, is that like all these problems of Leninism are the problems of Leninism, and yet McNair wants to do a better version of Leninism. And I've yet to see anything that looks or smells like Leninism not be this toxic, puritanical crusade. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like that just slides towards Stalinist apologism. Like even the Khrushchev period, like in some ways more historically progressive than the Bolshevik period. <laughs> Why? Because in the in, in in the Khrushchev period, they're kind of drawing down from autocracy instead of building up to it. 
So like coming through McNair has given me an appreciation for that period. I wouldn't have otherwise had, but <laughs> like, even then, like people that are astute observers of the Khrushchev time period, you know, the dude still send in the tanks and apologize for the Soviet system, like the structure of the Soviet system to a great degree. And in many ways, Khrushchev is a Stalinist in a way that will scramble brains to people that are super into anti-revisionism, but in a way that makes sense to a lot of people that aren't communists, right? Or even people that aren't, um, that aren't Leninists. Well, and it seems like even for those who are arguably consistently anti-Stalinist and they aren't, they aren't apologizing for it that much, if they're allowing these people into the party knowing full well these criticisms that we see here about what they always do and what they will do to you if you're not part of their pure cadre, it, it'll it just capitulate to that in form. It doesn't matter what they believe. Like, their organization will just fall yeah. apart due to these so dynamics. Are, are, we, are we making the case for, like, we had to split with the, with the right socialists and anarchists, you have to split from the Stalinists? It seems to be what so. people are I, saying. I it, it seems in like to but, me it seems like instinctually absolutely yeah yeah it's very important it's more it's i don't you know sometimes it comes up look these stalinists i mean they're just a bunch of cranks you know what i mean they're not like uh they're not like the democratic party they're not in power here you know why are you so afraid of them what's you know what's the problem like and like isn't the democratic party a bigger problem and and it's like that's totally besides the point. It's not that we need a pure movement. We need the broadest possible unity. But in the same way that you can have principled programmatic unity with, you know, the right and bourgeois progressive elements or whatever, and st still have organizational distinctness, you have to have organizational distinctness from Stalinists. And honestly, there, I can think of a lot of progressive bourgeois causes that I'd much rather be seen aligned with than fucking Stalinists. <laughs> like, I'm afraid so. Well, the thing is, too, is like, so, you know, I used to be friends with somebody who was like involved with C4SS, and they were constantly freaked out about Stalinism. And the issue is ultimately, like, yes, they're a bunch of fucking dweebs, cranks, they're never going to get power. Or they're a bunch of edgy online teenagers, right? And so like, they're not a real physical threat, but what they are is a threat to organizing. They're, 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 they're there to mislead the working class to just redo all the same bullshit that's been done before. There will always be a roadblock to communism and to see them as anything else. It's not because, it's not because I'm afraid I'm going to get gulag gulagged. It's because I'm afraid they're just going to wreck shit, which is right. what they've done. I, I much prefer the idea of glue lag, where you get like loads of glue and you can sniff glue while you're <laughs> in Siberia for a long time. That could be good. A little stave off the cold. On this episode, you heard the theme tune The Order of the Pharaonic Jesters and The Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. Thanks for listening, and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, Marx's podcast and research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit and Swampside Chats.